So all set? Yes, sir. All right, so we start. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pseu Nephropathology, which is 8G. And we are streaming live from Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, via Kolkata. And today we have a very special topic, which is a slide seminar on various nephropathological cases. And uh, we have two eminent people here. First, let me introduce the moderator, Dr. Debasis Guchayat who is an MD from SCB Medical College, Katak, a senior resident from PGI Chandigarh, PDCC Nephropathology from PGI Chandigarh, presently is an associate professor in pathology in Jipmar Puducherry with multiple international and national publications. He is the moderator and he will be introducing the speaker. Before I ask Dr. Devashish to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted. Please keep your camera off and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Devashish sir, please take over and introduce the speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Nadim sir. And uh, welcome all uh, to this special session of uh, special cases in nephropathology. Uh, it will be a very interesting session in the sense that uh, the routine topics are very boring when we are talking a didactic lecture kind. And if anybody else of you have heard uh, Dr. Mahesa before, you will be really excited to listen to him because I have had occasions to listen to him on the dais. So it will be a very interesting session of 15 cases around. He will be presenting in different, uh, like it will be classified into different spectrums. So it should be easy for you to follow. And uh, as like uh, Dr. Mahesha is like my elder brother who is uh, like little senior to me, and I know him from PGI days when uh, like I've heard of him that he used to be good and great. So he is uh, right now a consultant nephropathologist and head at the Manipal Hospital. And uh, he has got a beautiful lab. I, I promise that if you go to his lab, you'll never be disappointed to see those slides, the sections, the stains, uh, the quality of stains, the quality of slides. Uh, I, I have become a fan of his after visiting his lab uh, once I saw those sections uh, uh, which were much better than like I would say like maybe a little bit better than PJ and Jipper also what we practice or what we take sections and all. So after doing his uh, MBBS from Hubli, he did his MD from PJ, then he did a fellowship from PJ in Nephropath, following which he went to US also for some time and he did a fellowship in again uh, a kind of observership in Nephropathology for a year. And uh, then he's also uh, like uh, you can say he trained in clinical nephropathology for a year uh, in the ISO uh, like uh, certificate course. That's that's an online course through which he is certified. And uh, he has his field of expertise in mostly in uh, nephro and nephropathology related. Like you can say urogenital pathology or nephro nephro urogenitality. And uh, he has uh, many awards uh, to his credit, like establishing the the excellent center of excellence in manipal hospital nephropathology lab in manipal hospital and uh, in addition to that he's a guide for the fellowship nephro fellowship course as well as he's a member of many societies like the isrtp iapm and uh, uh, karnataka chapter also and uh, he boasts of uh, many chapters in uh, nephropathology textbook and uh, it is really a privilege, uh, Mysa sir, I would say, to introduce you to the to the uh, listeners. And I, 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 I hope and expect that they will definitely find this very interesting and it will be a great learning session for them. So you just have to press present now. Dr. Mysa, please start. Yeah. Your entire screen, yeah, fantastic, yeah. So very good evening to all of you here. It's an honor and pleasure to be here in the uh, Neelam le lecture series. Uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Devashish, uh, thanks for those uh, kind words. I hope I'll not disappoint you or any other uh, in the audience section by having the interesting cases that I've come across uh, in my uh, career so far here in the Manipal Hospital. Uh, before beginning, this is just a disclaimer uh, as usual. Uh, 
my sincere uh, gratitude to all the faculties in various departments in PGA, uh, Pathology, Chandigarh, who have trained me, nurtured me, uh, and uh, the mentors in nephropathology, uh, each of them are unique in their own style of teaching. Uh, uh, Dr. Joshi Maiman, Dr. Ithamra, Dr. Arthur Cohen, and Dr. Asintia Nast, and Dr. Sudarshan Ballal and his team where I interact with uh, most of the nephrologists. I am surrounded by a, a very good number of nephrologists here in the Bangalore. Uh, thanks to all of them. Uh, I have learned the clinical relevant part of nephropathology, clinical relevance, uh, while discussing with all of the nephrologists here. And we do conduct the kidney biopsy round and get to learn more things. This is the, uh, another extended family where uh, we learn uh, each other uh, in, in annual settings of uh, meeting of the renal pathology and transplant uh, uh, conferences. Uh, last held was in 2019. Unfortunately, the 2020 was uh, uh, withdrawn because of the COVID. We hope that uh, with the vaccine, we get to see face-to-face uh, -face in the upcoming conferences. So ne nephropathology is all about the uh, handling the tissue, the renal biopsy material, and the interpretation, which is uh, reasonably uh, set in, in the background of clinical presentation. So uh, uh, both of them are tied to each other, like husband and wife. Uh, in isolation, it makes no sense. And the, uh, yeah, another factor would be to interpret in terms of uh, uh, activity and the prognosis of any given lesion. Uh, to have all this, we need to address uh, certain points like adequacy of the tissue or adequacy of the clinical uh, information that is provided in the clinical form so that uh, it, you know, both of them uh, put together uh, are interpreted in the right context. So I'll be dealing with more, most in all these cases which I've selected is more pertaining to the diagnosis uh, 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 in the next one or one and a half hours. So please bear with me that it may go up to one and a half hours. Uh, have a cup of coffee or whatever you feel like to be alert and not doze off. Uh, 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 so to begin with, uh, the, uh, 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 the clinical patterns where we uh, get the clinical history uh, from the nephrologist who does the nef uh, renal biopsies uh, or to look for uh, the comorbidities and the symptoms that the patient has like uh, the renal parameters or the systemic symptoms, uh, the list which is uh, given at the bottom and further to uh, the information that is gathered from these, they are uh, categorized as uh, nephrotic or a nephritic or just asymptomatic hematuria or proteinuria and uh, RPRF, acute renal injury uh, and chronic renal failure. So, uh, uh, so all these clinical patterns, these are color coded to the lesion that is expected in the renal biopsy. As you see here, if it's a patient with a nephrotic syndrome, these are the clinical differentials. So it's left uh, for the renal histology to uh, show us what uh, is the lesion per se. So the interesting cases that I have selected here is uh, basically forming this outline. So I, I don't have a, a particular uh, set as an outline for the uh, talk, but the interesting cases I have selected, keeping in mind that whichever has gone in for a deep step serial sections or a special stains, which has some unusual staining character so that, that we learn uh, uh, new things. Or if there is a lesion which is unexpected, uh, completely blues off you uh, from the uh, renal histology, which is uh, new to the nephrologist or even to us, uh, and some cases where you need further clinical information or lab results or uh, you want to read uh, a textbook when you see something uh, which is very unusual. And the other would be like if you are encountering in a rare lesion, you would like to have a second opinion so, so that uh, you, you are convinced that what you are thinking is in the right line. So you 
take the opinion of your colleagues. I have uh, here Dr. Kiran with me, who is again a nephropathologist. Uh, I have. So whenever I have any difficulty, like he also shares, and I uh, we exchange uh, the ideas. And also now it's the social uh, media. We can always uh, uh, go back to the social media or WhatsApp group. We share in the images uh, and seek opinions. And the third would be where we have a limitation of core biopsy. So how do we uh, 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 overcome this challenging scenario of uh, with a limited uh, tissue. So I have uh, grouped all these cases, next 15 cases, in terms of what the ritual used to be in uh, in our department in PGH uh, uh, Chandigarh. Like uh, some activities would be there on all the weekdays I have listed uh, on the right hand side uh, and the cases are grouped in, in such a manner. Uh, you, you. Uh, if anybody is new to this uh, lecture series of uh, Neelam lecture series, I would recommend you to go back uh, uh, and listen to these uh, wonderful lectures given by Dr. Subhadev Mitra and Dr. Devishish uh, uh, about on the nephrotic, the basics, the terminologies, the patents, uh, and, and all those things. And to have this uh, in continuity, the article that I've chosen for Saturday, like it, it used to be uh, 8 in the morning and in that uh, cold weather in Chandigarh, it was very difficult to uh, enter the general club room before 8. It was always after 8, just sneaking through the uh, door and find out where we could be seated. So the article uh, is uh, in, in the line with the previous uh, lectures on the basics and the approach. This is one of the uh, uh, article which uh, uh, kind of standardized uh, uh, manner of reporting and the interpretation of uh, a renal biopsy, uh, which Dr. Sanjeev Sethi, with his vast experience, has come across. He has put his thoughts uh, and uh, has uh, come up with this interesting uh, manuscript. Um, I would recommend everybody to read this article, uh, be it the, on the pathology side or on the nephrology uh, side, the residents should definitely read this. Uh, the, the five cardinal questions that uh, uh, he has put in this manuscript is, what is the diagnosis? How active is the lesion? Is there any uh, ATN along with the, uh, uh, the lesion per se? And on the other side, the flip side is that, how bad is the uh, renal uh, parenchymal injury, like in terms of having scarring? Uh, and based on this scarring, is it worth giving the immunosuppression uh, uh, as it was in the acute stage, or uh, uh, is it uh, too late to treat? So uh, believe me, these are the questions which we all, as a, a nephropathologist who are uh, practices renal pathology, would be uh, given these five questions uh, from the nephrologist so that that makes a meaning uh, for performing the kidney biopsy and the intent to look for uh, what's the diagnosis and how do we uh, manage further. So the, uh, uh, two slides from this uh, pay, uh, article is about the primary diagnosis and this heavily relies upon the immunofluorescence. So uh, whether the immunofluorescence is showing uh, IgA nephropathy or a full house or if there is any IgG and C3 or if there is a IgG uh, within the mesangial region. So uh, based on all this uh, location and the type of immunoglobulins or complements, we would uh, further segregate this uh, in terms of immune complex or a C3 glomerulopathy uh, following which you need electron microscopy or a complement assays to further tease out these. And if none of them are above the threshold of 2+, plus, uh, then it is assigned as an ANCA-associated GN. And clinically, you would want to modify uh, uh, based on the results of uh, uh, serologies of ANCA, whether it is uh, PR3 or MPO uh, positivity. And similarly, the anti-GBM, which would be lighting up in the immunofluorescence, and when you uh, in a consult the nephrologist and say that it is a case of crescentic which is quite active and uh, IF shows linear then they would 
I want to immediately treat rather than waiting for the serum uh, antibodies of anti-GBM. So such is the importance of renal biopsy in terms of uh, management of uh, GN per se. So and the pattern of injury, the second is that of a pattern of injury which uh, goes on to say that what is the kind of proliferation and the location of these proliferation, whether it is mesangial or endocapillary or even extracapillary uh, and if there is any sclerosing component associated with these uh, active lesions. So uh, are, uh, the uh, SLE being the prototype of autoimmune disease will have a multiple pattern. So that, that th those are the clues that one would uh, be uh, hinted towards that uh, dealing with the autoimmune disease. And there are different uh, uh, scores or class gradings the, so that uh, whenever uh, 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 nephrologist sees the report that the, this is the activity score of per, uh, pertinent to the IgA nephropathy, like in terms of MEST scoring uh, or in the lupus, it's ISN RPS classification uh, uh, to follow with based on the uh, immunosuppression that they could, uh, or even like class three or class four on one side and class five on the other side. So the, the treatment uh, approaches are uh, different for each of the classes. So additional modifiers, additional findings in the pathology like ATN or interstitial nephritis or even atheroembolic uh, disease. Uh, so ancillary studies, uh, we do uh, all this uh, uh, in terms of uh, subclassifying the IgG as 1, 2, 3 and 4 to see whether it is a, a primary or a secondary uh, uh, disease process uh, based on the subclass and uh, immunohistochemistry for DNA JB9 uh, uh, and, and sometimes we do uh, uh, this enzyme digestion of uh, paraffin sections so that to reveal the mass antigens or if there is no immunofluorescence score then we will have to end up with uh, doing the IF on paraffin section. So the, uh, uh, the second, uh, the last part would be that of a grading of chronic changes. So uh, uh, again, this is from Dr. Sethi's uh, earlier uh, article on how to score each of the individual departments uh, so that there is uniformity across the lab. So the, the, the nephrologist who sees the report will get a, a sense of how aggressive he should be in the uh, dosage of immunosuppressants. Uh, this was about the article. Uh, coming to the Friday session that was used to be at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, a renal biopsy round. Uh, 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 there would be around six or seven cases where uh, the cases would be projected on the uh, uh, board and uh, the nephrology, we, we also do the similar way. Uh, the nephrology resident would interpret and the clinical, uh, uh, the pathology resident would be taking questions from the nephrology side. So it was a crisscross uh, uh, Q&A uh, between the depart two departments. So I have eight cases in this uh, 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 biopsy round kind of thing, which has a uh, theme uh, I'll come at the end. Uh, this is about a 40 years male who has a nephrotic range proteinuria uh, of almost eight and a half grams per day uh, with a serum albumin of three and having a normal renal function. The serologists were all negative with a normal size kidneys. So this was a scanner view uh, which had a major chunk of it was uh, the medulla and from here uh, you can see that there are uh, uh, there is a representation of cortex and in this uh, same H and E slide, you can see that there is one glomerulus in, in this uh, entire core. So at the high magnification of this, uh, there is, uh, uh, you, uh, it's uh, the PA stain, which shows that some sla uh, uh, mesangial region is appreciated uh, apart from uh, the normal cellularity in each of the uh, uh, mesangial area and the endothelium is normal. However, the basin membranes are standing out. They are very stiff uh, and they appear thickened. Uh, so in the immunofluorescence also, there was one core, uh, I mean the one glomerulus in the core, 
which showed a positivity of uniform granular pattern of IgG in, in this uh, glomerular capillary walls. So it was mainly uh, uh, staining along the walls. So based on this uh, uh, light microscopy and the uh, immunofluorescence, a diagnosis of membranous glomerular nephritis was made. And further to it, uh, in the current era, like in the last one decade, the, uh, the dynamic uh, 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 the primary antibodies or the primary antigens of MGN has uh, changed to a greater extent. Uh, it would not stop at the membranes with the immunofluorescence of IgG and C3. Uh, now we have the array of uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry to further tease out the primary antigens. So in that, uh, the PLA2R is one of the antigen and this is the immunohistochemistry chemistry which uh, basically highlights the same area of uh, positivity along the capillaries which you had seen in the uh, IgG uh, immunofluorescence. So this goes on to say that it is a PLA2R uh, membranous glomerular nephritis which is a uh, primary antigen uh, mediated. So this is what I was referring to the uh, once the diagnosis of membranous nephropathy is done uh, as the usual antigen is PLA2R. Uh, first you do the IHC for this or the immunofluorescence whichever is uh, done at your lab. Uh, if it's positive, then you assign that as a PLA2 positive membranous GN, or if it is negative, then it opens a, uh, a Pandora of uh, various, like with the patient a child, where you would like to see this uh, S uh, SEMA 3B, uh, or if the IgG pattern is global, which I showed you in the previous slide, or if it is a segmental, then it has a connotation for it could be a NIL1 antigen. Uh, the, these uh, these two subgroups can be associated with malignancy. So, uh, so uh, um, this is a wide uh, array of uh, algorithm uh, based for membranous nephropathy. So we'll move on to the second case. Uh, I can have the questions of at the end of eight cases, uh, or if you feel like at the end, uh, anything is fine for me. So the second case is about a 76 year uh, male uh, who presented with RPRF and the anchor serology is negative, uh, uh, the complements are normal and he had some chest uh, symptoms uh, for, uh, for which the CT thorax was done and it revealed a right mid lobe cavity. So cavitatory lesion along with RPRF uh, and the uh, bronchiole alveolar lavage is negative for TBPCR. So the biopsy was done in in the in the hindsight of uh, differentials of RPRF. So this is uh, the core at the scanning view. What you see here is all represented by the medullary tissue. There was no cortex uh, sampled in the uh, core that was sent in formalin. Uh, and at this scanner view, you can see that there are pockets, multiple pockets of some lesion which. Uh, which would be obviously, uh, you'll go on to the C next slides. So this was the histology of uh, those encircled areas. So uh, here there is almost like a necrotic uh, area, which is kind of uh, well-defined, uh, rather uh, not well-defined. Uh, uh, they are having uh, nuclear debris as well as neutrophils. Uh, which are falling in a single pattern, which are encircling the deeper medullary tubules. So at the high magnification, what you see here is the, those garland of uh, neutrophils, which are in the vasa recta surrounding these tubules, so uh, uh, injuring the endothelial lining of these vasa recta. So this was quite diffuse in, all, uh, in the entire tissue uh, and uh, having the uh, uh, severe area of necrotic uh, uh, necrosis in the deep medullary region. So what you see, saw in the first uh, uh, scanner view. Uh, this is again just to show the uh, same findings of uh, segmented neutrophils which are in the vasa recta. So th this histology assigns to the entity called as a medullary angiitis. So the uh, immunofluorescence luckily had uh, two glomeruli. One of this is viable, which was negative for the immunoglobulin G and all the rest of the panels. And uh, the tissue was reprocessed. There was one sclerotic 
like uh, I mean uh, glom, which on the special stain, the silver stain, revealed that it is indeed a fibrous crescent. This glom was unremarkable, and you can easily make out that the uh, tufts are non-proliferative. Uh, and they do not have any necrotizing lesion or as such in this single viable glom. So basically, it's, it's a case of medullary angiitis with the uh, uh, crescent, which is fibrous crescent in the uh, one sampled glomerulus. So this is about the medullary angiitis so, uh, where uh, Dr. Pa Patrick Walker has come up with a large uh, number of series of this uh, medullary angiitis, which are uh, associated classically with the ANCA lesion. Although in, in this patient, what I showed the renal biopsy, the ANCA test was negative. And some patients uh, may also be of Ig nephropathy, or rarely it could be an antibiotic, uh, antibiotic uh, treatment induced uh, uh, medullary damage. So the index case, what we are looking at, and based on the immunofluorescence being negative, so we, we kind of get back to this uh, table uh, or the chart where uh, based on the clinical presentation and the presence or absence of ANCA, where would this fit in? So uh, although the tissue was limited and we do not have the information on the presence or absence of granuloma uh, and the eosinophils, the um, uh, likely bet would be that uh, this patient would fit in this renal limited posseumian glomerular nephritis uh, or uh, it, the chest symptom what he had the cavitary lesion would be of a systemic manifestation of posseumian glomerular nephritis uh, which is ANCA negative. Uh, the third case is that of a 58 year old uh, male who presented with uh, unexplained uh, renal failure uh, with a creatinine of uh, 6.8 milligram per uh, deciliter and uh, the complements were normal, uh, the viral markers were not negative. So this was the tissue that we were uh, having. This is a scanner view there are, and if you see that there is no glomerulus in this, uh, but there are contents in these tubules which you would like to see at the highest higher magnification. This is a, a meson trichrome giving this crimson red color in some of these casts in the tubular lumen. So as you go on to the medium magnification, you see these various shapes and you can see a line here which is dissecting this uh, cast at this magnification. And on the high magnification, you see that this is a PA stain and you have this uh, color of the tubular basin membrane, which serves as a internal control. Which you base your interpretation of that looks very weak positive, uh, and you can see a rim of uh, PS positive material which is uh, encircling this uh, larger amount of negative or weak positive gas. And similarly here, uh, which is quite uh, uh, negative in, in the content of these tubular lumen. So as you look upon the meson trichome, which is one of the best stain uh, uh, in, in this lesion, uh, which gives uh, a bright red or a crimson red color to all these monoclonal casts. Uh, you have this fractured cast and they, they, are, they have different shapes. Uh, that's because of the uh, angulation that the, this tubule would have imparted on the uh, surface of this uh, cast. So uh, uh, here you can see that it's fractured. And these are the ones which are uh, uh, usually the uh, non-monoclonal cast or the Tamhausfold protein cast which is seen in the tubular lemon of this uh, uh, in this patient. So in the immunofluorescence, you have, uh, you can notice that there is uh, lighting up with the lambda uh, immunofluorescent uh, antibody, uh, whereas negative with the kappa. So uh, in this case is clearly that of a um, monoclonal light chain cast nephropathy with the lambda restriction. So for, further to this, uh, the patient would be evaluated for 
uh, all the parameters of plasma cell dyscrasia right from uh, the CBC, the ESR, the uh, bone marrow, free light chain as say beta 2 microglobulin and they have a staging mechanism uh, after which they uh, start the uh, uh, anti chemotherapy uh, having the beta 2 microglobulin as a baseline or the free light chain assays uh, as the baseline before starting and see how the response is following the uh, in the following months so next case is about uh, uh, a 58 year male with a nephrotic range proteinuria of 10 grams with uh, presence of renal dysfunction as you see uh, there is uh, this patient is hypotensive and again here at the scanner view what you see here is a uh, major chunk of it is the medulla and a small portion of cortex is sampled in uh, basically this needle has gone quite deep uh, and has taken the medullary area uh, you can see even the urothelial in, at the, uh, in the highest magnification fortunately this patient didn't have uh, the complications related to this uh, deeper tissue presence in the uh, biopsy so from here, uh, these are the high uh, magnifications, the photographs starting from the cortex here. These are the usual PS positive. And as you go down here, this portion of uh, is represented in these two, where you see that the uh, tubules are widened, uh, set apart by the interstitial expanding uh, lesion. And this was basically the same thing what you uh, anticipate in in case of uh, amyloid uh, uh, deposition and that it was uh, seen in the tubular basin membrane as well as in the interstitium uh, just like uh, as any other uh, plasma cell dyscrasias or uh, in in the amyloid it would be a weak positive uh, on pas and the silver strain this is the usual uh, staining pattern of amyloidosis uh, and uh, the congruent stain, uh, the one which I was referring to is uh, the urothelium in this biopsy is here. The, uh, the congruent stain here uh, uh, showing the birefringence in, in this relatively thicker portion, although you don't see the birefringence here at the, the uh, uh, lesser um, micron section in this portion of the tissue. It's more obviously seen in the thicker uh, region and in the immunofluorescence there was no light chain restriction uh, we went ahead and did the uh, IHC for serum amyloid A uh, and it was brightly positive in all of these interstitials so this uh, was uh, about uh, uh, case of uh, secondary amyloidosis based on these findings but this case is a perfect uh, case to be analyzed uh, for uh, apolipoprotein A4 uh, because the the amyloidosis associated with medullary uh, predominant deposition is uh, usually with this kind of a uh, uh, abnormality. So the, if we had the facility to do the mass spectrometry and the, uh, analyze it further, then this is what uh, we were uh, very keen on looking in this case. So some uh, learning points on the amyloid uh, uh, that I've learned during the practice here is uh, whenever a patient is hypotensive and he has a nephrotic range uh, proteinuria and happens to be above the age of 50. So uh, your likelihood of anticipating the biopsy lesion as amyloidosis is almost uh, 90%. And by chance if there is a liver function test also done and if there is a uh, uh, higher elevation of alkaline phosphatase I, i'm certain that i mean this uh, uh, biopsy is going to show me the amyloidosis now uh, this learning is more uh, for the pathologist rather than the nephrologist they would be knowing it much better uh, but Whenever a pathologist uh, sees the clinician, uh, the clinical form uh, to see what the presentation is. So these are the things which uh, uh, we should be looking at uh, when you're analyzing the clinical data. 
and most of the amyloid uh, is uh, silver negative but in case if you have the silver positivity in in the confirmed case of amyloidosis it's going to be uh, al in my uh, uh, experience i have uh, almost around uh, 10 or 12 cases where the stains would show that it is a positivity uh, of with a silver stain and moving forward prospectively uh, you know, the likelihood of it turning out to be al amyloid is 100% uh, as far as uh, uh, my uh, uh, learning goes here uh, i am yet to see a silver positive and uh, uh, negative uh, light chain restriction in the immunofluorescence so j just uh, 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 two words about the approach that the all the uh, uh, the pathologist should uh, do is in an elderly with a nephrotic range never miss uh, uh, doing a congruent stain because the early it may look like a non proliferative or a normal appearing glomerulus but it could be the early uh, sign or uh, early deposition of amyloid in in that case and it's always prudent to do a thicker section this is the only area uh, in in the renal pathology that one would do a thick section to have that birefringence very much evident otherwise it will be very difficult to uh, pick up the uh, birefringence so the next case is about uh, a 36 uh, post trans 36 years who uh, is a post transplant uh, uh, presenting with graft dysfunction and mild proteinuria uh, again here uh, this is the available tissue uh, with only one glomerulus at the deeper cuts, you, you're not able to see in, uh, in, in, uh, in the superficial cuts. But uh, when we, as a routine practice, we do around 36 or 40 uh, step serial sections. And in one of those, there was one glom. And here at the scanner view, you can see that there is uh, 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 acute tubular injury in the tubules. Uh, and some portion of it is like scarring region. Uh, in the interstitium, there are few scattered lymphomononuclear cells. Uh, and at the higher, higher uh, magnification, this is the only uh, lymphocyte which can be seen as uh, infiltrating the tubules, calling it as a tubulitis. Otherwise, uh, uh, more or less, the interstitial inflammation was uh, uh, seen. Uh, and uh, the peritubular capillaries also had leukocyte margination here. And the one glomerulus which was sampled in this deeper section showed the evidence of double contour in, in this region. Uh, you can see uh, two or three capillary loops which show uh, tram track appearance in a segmental uh, pattern. So uh, based on this, uh, we can uh, say that it is at least G1 score based on these leukocytes here in the capillary lumen with the swollen endothelial cell uh, and CG1B based on this finding and the PTC2, which is evident here, uh, the leukocytes, number of these leukocytes in the peritubular capillaries. So this uh, would be assigned uh, as a chronic active antibody-mediated rejection uh, uh, by the presence of this linear positivity along the peritubular capillaries with C4D. So at least we could arrive at that uh, the uh, lesion is uh, antibody-mediated uh, rejection in, in this uh, limited tissue. So the next case is that of a, a post-transplant who had a slow graft dysfunction. Uh, he is uh, eight months post-transplant. This is a scanner view. And in this, uh, there are six gloms, as you can see here. Uh, there are six gloms and two arteries are there. Uh, uh, not much of inflammatory component uh, seen in this uh, interstitial space. So uh, at the uh, medium magnification, one can see that there are infiltrates which are scattered in the interstitium and surrounding these vessels. Uh, more so here in, in a kind of lymphoid aggregates. And in, uh, in this tubule, there is a mitotic figure which indicates that there is some kind of a regeneration going on and on the right hand side you see that some of these deeper uh, uh, distal tubules show uh, inclusions within the nucleus so uh, this 
uh, makes one to suspect that of a BK polyamor virus nephropathy. And uh, this is the immunohistochemistry chemistry for SV40, which highlights these uh, uh, infected nuclei. Uh, so this portion of the affected uh, by viral cytopathic effects was representing this portion. So uh, for instance, if this portion was not sampled and we had only this much of uh, renal tissue, based on the findings of interstitial inflammation and very occasional uh, tubulitis, uh, we would have misdiagnosed this as a borderline uh, acute cell-mediated rejection. Uh, so it is always good to do the SV40 whenever you have a uh, limited tissue or uh, even for that matter, the uh, sampling issues for to look for SV PK polyoma goes extensive in having two medullary, uh, two cores, which has a representation of medulla in both of the cores. Uh, just about the uh, classification of BK polyoma in this chart, uh, we usually look for the inclusions and then come from that with the IHC uh, and look for the IFTA, that's interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, whether it is 50% less than that or more than that. And based on that, uh, we assign the staging. Uh, and if there is a very chronic uh, tubular interstitial damage, uh, uh, the chances of graft survival will go drastically down. Uh, but uh, definitely in, in the stage 1 and B, uh, with a lesser amount of chronic uh, damage, there is uh, 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 a good outcome compared to stage C. So uh, a few points on the decoy cells. Uh, uh, the uh, decoy cells, when you are uh, seeing in, in, in the setting of post-transplant patient, uh, when the urine sample is collected to evaluate for slow graft dysfunction, uh, you have a uh, threshold for the decoy cells too low so that you don't want to miss out a decoy cell and call it as there's no decoy cells provided you have given the sample addicts, pre analytical uh, portion of urine sample collection, everything is in the right place and the interpretation of your, uh, the decoy cells is negative, then it is going to shut the door for uh, BK polyoma virus further work up by the clinician. So never uh, ever give a negative report without analyzing what is the pre-analytical portion in, in a given patient. Because these are the viral cytopathic effects in the urothelium. They are very fragile. They, they, they lyse quickly. Uh, 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 so, if there is a delay in the transit of uh, samples, then you might end up in calling it as negative, which the clinician thinks that it is a urine is negative, so it, it's not going to uh, have in the blood or the uh, 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 parenchymal damage. So, that's the importance of urine decoy cells. So, uh, if, as you see here, the negative predictive value is 100%. Uh, that's why uh, uh, before signing it out as negative, you think all about all the uh, pre-analytical portion. This is another uh, similar case where we had a BK inclusion, but only one glomerulus in this entire core. And as you see here, uh, it's the viral load is quite extensive in this uh, core. Uh, so the biopsy interpretation, uh, the adequacy of the renal tissue uh, goes on uh, to say that the length of the core should be one and a half centimeter, which basically is this cortex uh, is almost one to one and a half centimeter and deeper portion is the middle large. So the needle goes through and through here and samples uh, whatever tissue it, uh, based on the angle of the needle. So uh, the diagnosis, uh, diagnostic entities uh, or the morphologic predictors in the limited tissue, here is a list what I have prepared uh, that you would try to look hard in a challenging uh, scenario when you are given with a limited tissue. So like membranous GN amyloidosis or ANCA-mediated uh, carcinopathy or the crystal deposition, uh, uh, BK polyoma or antibody-mediated rejection. So, so this is uh, what I try to uh, put in the case scenario basis. Uh, 
and of course these are not diagnostic but they give some information to the clinicians uh, based on which he will triage further uh, before uh, uh, doing a repeat biopsy because this is a traumatic uh, kind of procedure and uh, it involves a greater amount of counseling to the patient from the clinician that we may have to do a repeat biopsy. So I always try to look for if there is any uh, finding that may help clinicians in further uh, triaging. Uh, uh, this one uh, slide for the representation of uh, biopsy material, we always look for number of glomeruli to rule out any focal lesion. So th this is uh, the list of uh, gloms and the chance of missing the focal lesions, whether it may be a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or a thrombotic microangiopathy as an example. Uh, if we have 10 gloms, there is a likelihood of missing the lesion of focal process in almost 35% of cases. So th that's the uh, uh, power of having number of glomeruli sampled in the given tissue. Location of glomeruli is also uh, important because some of the lesions like FSGS would begin in, in the glomeruli which are located uh, in the juxta medullary cortex, so the, uh, in this portion. And also the number of step serials, I've shown you that uh, the one uh, in, in a case of antibody mediated rejection, the deeper cuts reveal one single glomerulus. So that's the importance of having more number of uh, step serial sections uh, and also to pick up if there is any segmental lesion in a given glomerulus. So, uh, uh, eight or 12 cuts will not be uh, sufficient to uh, analyze the focal process. In the allograft, uh, we need 10 glomeruli and two arteries. The minimum would be seven and one artery. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is a kind of scenario where the pathologist is very much happy that uh, uh, when you have a uh, good number of cores, which all together in this patient had 60 gloms and in this child, uh, in a single glomerulus, there was 60, uh, 60 gloms. So the, the, the point I, I'm trying to drive here is uh, in children, uh, uh, the interstitial space is still in, in the process of evolution, like the interstitial pros, uh, uh, portion of uh, uh, is expanding. Uh, so that's the reason why there would be more number of gloms in even, uh, I'm happy with the 0.5 centimeter or 0.6 that would easily give me 20 gloms in, in, in case of kids but not in, in the adults uh, because of the wide displacing of the glomeruli uh, of, uh, by the tibular interstitial compartment. So coming to another case of a 52 year old male uh, who has a nephrotic range proteinuria and a normal renal function uh, with having only hypertension uh, uh, this, uh, in, in the hindsight of like uh, the adequacy of tissue, if you are given less number of uh, gloms, uh, to call it as suboptimal, on the flip side, even more number of gloms also would be uh, uh, sometimes challenging to interpret. This is one example for that uh, scenario, uh, having a normal renal function and a nephrotic range proteinuria. So as you see here, scanner view you have uh, almost 16 gloms and most of them are dark in this uh, silver stain only this glom is viable uh, and this is the capsular aspect so the number of obsolete gloms are more here in the subcapsular region what you see in this high magnification and even in the deeper portion there are uh, obsolete glom uh, in, in this uh, core so the single viable glom here again shows uh, non-proliferative tufts as well as thickening of the uh, capillary walls. And the, so there is some rarefication of the uh, capillary wall here in this region. But in the immunofluorescence, uh, there is lighting up of uh, capillary walls as seen in a case of membranous glomerulonephritis. So, so the, uh, to come at the diagnosis of membranous glomerulonephritis is uh, uh, is made easy by virtue of this uh, finding of thickened capillary wall and the immunofluorescence finding. But what about these number of uh, obsolete gloms which are spanning uh, in the subcortical zone and even in the mid cortex 
going in deeper region as well. So the, uh, this patient is having a normal renal function. So we, we in, in, in isolation, we, if we don't read each of the clinical information which the uh, nephrologist has given to you, you might call this as a chronic uh, GN, chronic membranous nephropathy, based on the number of obsolete glomes, which are quite deep. It's not just in the superficial, uh, but these are uh, uh, can be misleading if you try to interpret just based on the pathology perspective. So uh, the clinical information also needs to be uh, put in while you are interpreting. So this is a membranous glomerular nephritis with superficial cortical scar uh, uh, and I would uh, like to bring in this article which is a recent uh, uh, article which highlights the the glomerular volume and the glomerular sclerosis in the various, uh, usually we divide in the superficial cortex, the mid cortex and the juxta medullary cortex. So th these three regions are different. Uh, uh, this is a new learning for me in from this article, say, uh, which has commented about the glomerular volume, which is different in all these three zones. And the disease process also affects uh, differently, uh, especially in terms of uh, obesity related glomerulomegaly and uh, the diabetic uh, glomerulomegaly or the uh, obsolescence because of the diabetes. So I would recommend uh, to read uh, this article which is quite lengthy, it's almost 20 page article. Uh, moving on to another last case in this session is that of a uh, incidental mass lesion in the left kidney. Uh, for which uh, nephrectomy was performed and uh, the non-neoplastic part uh, was uh, uh, as you see here and there were some of the uh, tubular contents which on high magnification shows that these have a PS negative uh, reaction and uh, the patient was diabetic however the histology does not show any obvious features barring the earliest lesion which can be picked up in the ultrastructure but no obvious uh, class 2 or uh, 3 and 4 lesions of diabetes. But this uh, definitely calls for a uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry because there was uh, no uh, uh, fresh tissue taken at the time of uh, grossing of this uh, uh, sample and this was in the 2012 so we had no uh, protocol for doing IF on paraffin section. So we went and did the immunostochemistry chemistry for kappa and lambda, which shows that this is more intense with the kappa. Although lambda is uh, positive, but it is less intense compared to the kappa. So further workup uh, was done in this case. The neoplastic part was that of a clear cell RCC with a nuclear ferment grade of two. And the uh, uh, further workup showed that this patient indeed had more than 50% of plasma cells with a light chain restriction of kappa uh, with a skewed KL ratio and elevated IgG level. So uh, the non-neoplastic portion uh, in, in all the nephrectomies uh, also needs to be uh, diligently looked up uh, for any parenchymal medical renal uh, disease uh, per se. So uh, I have seen one, uh, this is one case which we had presented in Mysore conference and uh, I have uh, seen one more which Dr. Kiran had shared with me uh, of a papillary renal cell carcinoma having amyloidosis uh, in, in the uh, non-neoplastic portion. Some references with regards to uh, that. So basically the gist of this, all the eight cases in this Friday's uh, uh, was about how to handle or how challenging it will be uh, when you are dealing with the limited tissue or on the vice versa when you are ha having adequate that is even more challenging how do you interpret uh, in the clinical setting you you need to uh, gather all the uh, points from the clinicians and have a dialogue with him uh, to explain uh, each and every portion of clinical symptomatology or the syndrome syndromic presentation and what is the reflection in the renal histology. So I am happy to take any questions now or at the end. The beautiful, beautiful presentation, uh, Maisa sir, that's what I can say. All pretty simple cases. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
all pretty simple cases and but everything leaves you a message and every case had a message so for a practicing uh, nephropathologist or a pathologist uh, the amyloid stain in elderly for example you say like all elderly renal biopsy should be stained with amyloid not to miss out on minimal amyloidosis or it's about step serials that uh, can give you sometimes the pathological diagnosis whether it's a transplant or native biopsy then uh, relating to the adequacy criteria like uh, a pathology should not get disheartened that uh, there is no gloom but the pathology may actually be in the medulla and uh, many a times the primary pathology is in the medulla when we do not even need the gloom to be interpreted but it is ideal that we have the gloom but that message is also very loud and clear that adequacy uh, is case based like uh, uh, dr maisa said adequacy is case based uh, the clinical scenario based it should not be that we bluntly uh, like uh, stamp something as inadequate uh, based that glooms are not there or vessel is not there but the pathology may actually be evident and even uh, like having one gloom is enough to diagnose certain uh, like many disorders like amyloidosis or a diabetic nephropathy or a or a, you can say amyloidosis and um, mgm they are very easily diagnosed even from one gloom that's a, that's one message and uh, one people even mistake them as uh, urothelial abnormality epithelial abnormality so there also the clinical scenario has to be taken into account whether the patient is a, is a transplant patient or it's a, a non transplant patient elderly patient on which we are interpreting the urine so uh, i would like the participants to, to ask some questions in case you can unmute your mic so you can ask to dr maisa or you can keep them to the end also sir one question from me yeah uh, sir medullary angiitis uh, how often do you encounter like uh, till date i have been searching for it but i have never able to come across uh, such a thing but how often do you encounter them as a entity in this anca associated or this posthumous gn sir no it's quite rare i mean uh, uh, if i can recollect it it will be in a single digit uh, in the last 10 years so it's quite rare okay because the case you showed was so beautiful sir that uh, that around the tubules that angiitis that was like uh, super like that picture is like uh, uh, like that that is like you can hang it on the wall and keep seeing it it's so beautiful that was really nice sir <laughs> okay thanks thanks uh, so do we have questions or uh, we shall move on to the next seven cases sir in the chat box i don't see any questions so thanks. i think we can move on sir there okay. is there is a question from the youtube i uh, yes sir i'm just trying to forward that to dr devashish and on your whatsapp i've just forwarded it sir so uh, there are many comments are like people have congratulated you on the on the beautiful uh, stains uh, and uh, the, there is a crisp uh, like uh, uh, the, the 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 pictures they are taken and that is really nice and there is a question also sir from uh, namanita das uh, madam she wants to ask you a question is there any crisp histopathological definition for eskd no it's a, it's a clinical terminology eskd is uh basically we, we we are not going to touch upon the eskd whenever you are interpreting like uh, you are going to give a chronic staging uh, uh on the histopathology whatever the tubular interstitial or the glomerular compartment has chronic changes we're going to give a score that's all is in our hands so we, we are not going to write eskd in our report that's uh, uh uh that's Uh, i would say we should refrain from using the eskd terminology absolutely sir like madam i would also say same thing madam maisa sir has already elaborated on that that when we interpret a kidney biopsy we take into the whole clinical picture the whole neurological profile and then only we put our diagnosis still we would always refrain ourselves to putting a bit of like putting a death sentence for uh, somebody because uh, that's you are you are saying that the kidney are no more functional and patient has to be put on some other artificial means of uh, like uh, impression or something in fact uh, sir navanita madam has also congratulated you uh, she liked the message of evaluating non neoplastic kidney disease in uh, in us uh, and she has like thank you regarding that one thank you ma'am uh, dr manisha this is dr subhru i want to ask you one or two questions yes dr subhru please go ahead subhru so, uh, so uh, the first question is uh, 
when you have an early amyloidosis, which is where the thrombophilia can be seen, but uh, uh, more often we cannot really document the uh, underpolarizing microscopy, the apodrine birefringence, because it becomes a little dicey. So, what do you do? Uh, is there anything that you do uh, uh, to circumvent that? That's my number one question. And number two, uh, in one of your cases, uh, I think in the case of medullary angitis, there was a few you could document in... Um, the, uh, so, uh, can you elaborate that? How could you distinguish it from an obsolescent glomerulus? These are my questions and these are wonderful cases. I have nothing to say. We are, I am kind of uh, spellbound. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subro. Uh, the first question is about the uh, early amyloidosis. Uh, I would do a thicker section and do the congruent on thick section. That's the first part. And the second would uh, try to do it uh, by using uh, the uh, changing the uh, filter off to see if there is any uh, fluorescence there or, or uh, Ultimately, it would be uh, the demonstration of uh, amyloid fibrils in the ultrastructures who would subject the paraffin block if there is no separate tissue uh, for uh, EM. So uh, these are the three things that would I, uh, I would do if I am strongly thinking that this biopsy needs a thorough uh, evaluation for amyloid uh, angle. Right. Okay. And the second question, like the silver stain, Stain which picked up the fibrous crescent. Uh, usually in the HND stain, it will be very difficult to dissect whether this is a obsolescent glom or uh, a fibrous crescent, as you saw in that uh, uh, picture on the left side. Uh, the, uh, the special stains would be of helpful for you to see how the uh, in uh, extra capillary that's the Bowman space is occupied by. Uh, and the underlying tufts. So in a uh, given case like diabetic, when there is a accumulation of collagen within the uh, inside of the Bowman space, so that also looks similar to uh, fibrous crescent, which sometimes may be mistaken as fibrous crescent, but uh, you need to uh, 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 see very uh, little points in, in terms of whether the tuft is uh, tough to the Bowman space uh, ratio of the whatever the pathology that's the fibrous crescent is seen. I mean, in this it was uh, uh, difficult to compare with other set of gloms because it was not there. But you mm -hmm. always take the help of what's the other glom findings are. Uh, yeah, uh, that yes. is also very helpful uh, in in dissecting whether a uh, given case is related to ANCA or otherwise. Sir, I would like to add one point for Dr. Shubra. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shubra, I think whenever we suspect amyloid, I think if we, even if we are not able to confirm, we should put it in our end note so that the clinician may investigate the patient further. Instead of yeah. just saying that it's negative, I think we should lead yeah. them so that they can investigate or they can subject the patient, maybe the biopsy for a EM, even if the tissue they have not taken at the initial time. And then they can confirm it through EM <coughs> structurally. Yes, absolutely. Good evening, Devashish. Can I talk? Uh, sure, ma'am. Please. <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> You're welcome, ma'am. Please. Pleasure okay, to okay. hear you, ma'am. So, I thought, let me just make one uh, comment in regard to what uh, Shubro has asked. Uh, uh, what I've observed over the, the time is that when you have this kind of problem of uh, localizing small amount of amyloid, uh, the best uh, one mistake which we do, uh, tend to do is we try to look for by uh, refringence in a bi header mm -hmm. or a multi header. Never mm -hmm. try that. Go on a mono uh, header. You will mm -hmm. definitely be able to show the bi refringence. This I've seen practically in my uh, routine uh, practice. Whenever we uh, are doing during reporting time, you won't be able to uh, see it there. But since you need a very strong source of light, and if you go on a a kind of uh, mono uh, header, you will be able to demonstrate. Ooh, and I, I read wow. this somewhere uh, in one of articles, somewhere I read, then I practically I tried this and it really worked very well. That's wonderful. That's nice to learn. Yeah, that's really nice to learn. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay.
Dr. Mahesh, you can continue. Yeah. There, is, there is one comment in the YouTube which I thought it's pertinent to share right now. Yes, Professor sir. Kusum Joshi is there and she said, uh, as perfect as ever. <laughs> That is like oh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Please, please carry uh, it, on. It's, it's all uh, what you have uh, taught us. Uh, all the uh, students, where wherever they are, they are, they are under uh, the care of Dr. Kusum Joshi and Dr. Ritamra, ma'am. We we always are in the. We appreciate it, sir. Thanks. Uh, so the next is the softy session that used to be held uh, in you know, on Thursday at four in the uh, evening. Uh, that this is the most dreadful uh, event a resident can have. Uh, here, the resident would be on one side and the consultant would be on the other side of the table uh, bombarding with the various questions pertaining to the slide that they have uh, given on Tuesday evening so that the residents would uh, read and make some notes about it and they would be quizzed on Thursday evening. So there are four cases in this. Uh, this is about a 24-year female. Uh, I'm just adding the flavor of uh, all the activities in so that it, it, uh, it doesn't have the monotonous of case-based. Uh, it's some flavor attached to it. Uh, uh, this is about 24-year female who has uh, presented with uh, edema and facial puffiness so with a proteinuria of 2 plus and uh, 2 and a half gram on estimation of the urine protein uh, with the rest of the things being normal, the viral serology, the rest of everything. So in the histology, uh, some of the, uh, uh, in the audience group, some of them might have seen this case in, in the conference uh, when I presented this. Uh, so this is the low power uh, magnification of the glomerulus, uh, glomeruli uh, in different strains. They appear to be enlarged in, in all, all of these uh, uh, glomeruli. The glomerular size is pretty uh, big and there is some abnormality in terms of having clear area and the uh, cellularity uh, which is segmental in distribution in each of this glomerulus. So, uh, coming to the highest magnification of one representative photograph of this is uh, in this PA strain slide uh, you can see that the material that is deposited here which is completely uh, occupying this stuff which is uh, uh, vacuolated appearance the you can see the uh, clearing of this uh, region which is uh, completely obscuring the uh, capillary tuft as well as the lumen uh, and, uh, and the mesangial area is also some kind of a positivity is there with the PA stain but not the crisp positivity that is seen in uh, uh, usual normal mesangial matrix. So in the silver stain, again, this vacuolated appearance everywhere uh, in all of these stuff. Uh, apart from that, the capillary walls here uh, do shows these holes or the craters in the tangential section of this capillary walls. So the, uh, it uh, kind of giving the appearance of that this there would be kind of a, uh, a membranous look in some of these capillaries. So, so segmental uh, craters distribution is also seen. So in the immunofluorescence, this uh, was with the IgG, where there was a non-specific uh, positivity or in in a segmental distribution. Uh, although at some places you can see that they have a granular pattern, but uh, more or less it was uh, non-descript uh, in in the uh, glomerular tuft with the IgG, and rest of them were all negative. So th uh, this was the suspicion uh, based on this vacuolated appearance, uh, there was a suspicion that this could be a metabolic uh, 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 glomerulopathy and, uh, uh, and based on the morphology, we suspected that this this, is a, uh, this needs further evaluation in terms of uh, LCAT deficiency. The ultrastructure of this case showed a large irregular uh, granular uh, both uh, uh, dark appearing at the periphery as well as clearing at the uh, central portion of it uh, uh, in in the basin membrane as well as in the subepithelial uh, uh, subendothelial region or even in the mesangial region as you see here. Uh, so these were the electron dense as well as electron lucent particles which is quite characteristically seen with uh, the patients who have deficiency of LCAT uh, uh, enzyme. 
so further workup was done to look for all these uh, abnormalities and uh, the lipid profile which uh, tells more about the lipoproteins that is involved in this uh, case as you see here uh, the lipid profile of this index case at the presentation when the biopsy was done and following where at the six months interval and the mother and father and the elder sibling was also evaluated for this uh, uh, the in uh, to compare with the index case uh, you can see that the hdl was very low uh, in this index case and normal in mother as well as father and the elder sibling so uh, being, hdl being so low it it's almost hits the diagnosis of this is a lcap deficiency and the bone marrow was also showing similar uh, uh, material deposition in the aspirates as well as in the trifine biopsy as one saw in the renal uh, uh, biopsy uh, and the further clinical evaluation uh, was that this, this patient had a, a ring the whitish opaque uh, which is called as arcus senilis uh, uh, along, along the periphery of the cornea uh, usually seen in this uh, entity so the sanger sequencing of this gene was done and uh, there was a homozygous missense mutation uh, for uh, uh, the index patient although uh, the heterozygous uh, variation uh, variant was seen in parents as well as sibling uh, so the heterozygous variation and a normal hdl in the in their uh, uh, blood uh, so this confirms that this is a case of uh, lcat deficiency and this table is just to highlight about how do we tease about uh, tease the uh, information on this forminess in the my uh, renal histology and what are the differential diagnosis which one can uh, anticipate in whether it is a crystal storing histiocytosis or a histiocytic glomerulopathy which is usually uh, uh, devastating uh, in terms of uh, uh, the flh syndrome and affecting the kid, uh, glomeruli or uh, lcat deficiency or apoe uh, glomerulopathy so uh, this table highlights about the differences in all these entities so lcat deficiency is a, a plasma enzyme which uh, which is uh, very much required in handling of the uh, uh, lipids uh, you know, at the periphery of the tissues and uh, sending it back to the uh, liver uh, the deficiency is usually autosomal recessive and the affected organs are the cornea bone marrow and the kidneys uh, liver and spleen so either the uh, ophthalmologist would uh, see this quite often or uh, a hematologist where he is the patient is evaluated for anemia uh, in in some instances the patient uh, ends up in the nephrology department when the biopsy uh, uh, throws a, a light on what could be the further workup needed in this patient so the second case is uh, again in the same uh, continuum about uh, uh, another metabolic disease he is again a 47 year uh, male uh, no comorbidities in terms of non diabetes but he was uh, hypertensive at presentation with 1 plus albumin and bland sediments uh, uh, very less than a gram of uh, uh, protein leak and he had uh, grade 1 hypertensive changes uh, so at this panel, the striking thing is that of the Bowman space, uh, where you could see that the, there is vacuolated appearance, which is better seen in the HND stain than a PA stain here. Uh, the, the primary abnormality is in that of the podocytes, which are freely lying in the urinary space. So as you go into the highest magnification, then you see that the uh, vacuoles are expanding the cytoplasm of the podocytes in almost each and every capillary loop which is surrounded by the uh, podocyte has this vacuolations. Uh, uh, goes on to say that they, they, this is a podocyte vacuolite, uh, vacuolation defect. So the first thing that we would uh, uh, think of is this uh, kind of a Fabris disease or a mimicker of uh, Fabris disease in terms of drug history. So th this patient was male uh, um, in the immunofluorescence, as you see that there is negativity. Uh, the toledin blue 
uh, of this case fortunately we had the separate core for em and this is the toledin blue which shows this uh, the vacillation or uh, what was seen in the histology is occupied by these was swirling structures in in the photocyte cytoplasm these are more darkish in color dark blue in color in this tall blue uh, stain and in the electron microscopy alter structure that these uh, uh, myelin figures were uh, actually the ones which are uh, occupying those vacuolated appearance so basically in the formalin uh, fixation and then the procedure of uh, uh, the routine fear of uh, processing these uh, things uh, are, are, are not uh, they these do, do not uh, take up the stain in the hnd slides that's how you get to see this vacuolated appearance and these are the myelin figures which were uh, which is almost uh, nails the diagnosis as a fabris disease and uh, of course the uh, uh, enzyme defect would be given the primary diagnosis this is a lysosomal storage disorder which is excellent and the uh, uh, lipids that is accumulated goes on to deposit in various tissues uh, leading on to corneal opacities or uh, uh, sometimes they present uh, with a a renal failure uh, affecting uh, or even the uh, lvh or stroke in earlier uh, uh, period of life so, uh, the key thing is to ask for detailed family uh, history whether uh, uh, there is any uh, particular uh, disease the i mean the uh, renal disease which is running in the family so in, in the uh, retrospect this patient had a Uh, uh family history of all the maternal uncles uh, this uh, are being affected by the kidney disease so he was fortunate to get uh, funding for his uh, replacement of the enzyme and uh, he is doing good uh, this one article about uh, uh, with the uh, fabris disease uh, which gives us the perspective of how to go about in terms of uh, doing the transplant in in the patients who have fabris disease and when to suspect uh, the fabris in a setting of uh, 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 some systemic symptoms which has uh, angiokeratoma or uh, hypohidrosis so uh, on the uh, both male as well as females which, which, uh, who can be carriers as well and in in uh, taking up the donors uh for uh, end stage kidney disease uh, usually the females uh, uh, are uh, can be silent uh, carriers of the disease process uh, so that would run a risk of later on in the donor as well so that's why the females uh, are uh, not taken as a donors unless it is uh, the only donor so the uh, another case is that of a 54 year a uh, female who had uh, chronic kidney disease running uh, almost a year duration with a creatinine of 2 if you uh, note this there is no history of edema and the urine protein is 1 plus so, uh, so uh, by this the renal dysfunction without having any edema and the protein is 1 plus so it's almost certain that this patient doesn't have any primary glomerular disease uh, per se so uh, uh, the tubular interstitial disease is the one what the clinician would think of Uh, in the given given setting uh the renal histology was a surprise for uh, both of us the pathology as well as the nephrology colleagues uh, that in this uh, core there were some of the tubular contents which appeared were quite dark or brownish in color uh, which are seen in the tubular lumen and on the uh, uh, hnd stain they are more of a brownish in color So as you see th these are arranged in a radial uh, uh, pattern uh, in this uh, tubular lumen uh, even eliciting some kind of a epithelial reaction surrounding these crystals radially arranged crystals and when you uh, polarize this you would see that bright birefringence uh, which uh, uh, goes on to tell that this is a crystal uh, deposition disease which is affecting the tubular interstitium primarily in this given case uh, leading on to uh, chronic kidney disease so uh, this patient is almost in the fourth or fifth decade 
so th this uh, entity although it may uh, start in the beginning but the presentation is uh, quite late usually they come around uh, fourth or fifth decade uh, uh, the similar uh, crystals were also seen in the macrophages in the interstitium they were uh, loaded in in these macrophages and as you uh, uh, you can see these uh, uh, crystals much better here uh, and some of them are even seen in the tubular cytoplasm uh, as well so this is a PS stain uh, which shows still retains the brownish color because of uh, uh, the uh, crystal deposition uh, and the silver stain which imparts this blackish color in the in these crystals uh, the, these are the staining differences uh, I'll come to the table later uh, uh, in, in various special stains. The trichrome stain doesn't really give any flavor attached to this uh, crystals. They are more transparent here. And uh, we, uh, uh, myself and Dr. Kiran, we uh, summarize this as uh, chronic tubular interstitial nephritis with uh, uh, numerous deposition of these two, eight, dihydroxy at nine crystals in the uh, renal parenchyma and further uh, asked for evaluation uh, following which the genetic uh, testing was done and there was a homozygous mutation in this APRT. Uh, uh, uh. So this is basically a adenine phosphoribosyl transferase uh, deficiency which usually converts this adenine to AMP. Uh, in, in case of deficiency then this is uh, accumulated and these are secreted from the kidney and this structure 2,8-dehydroxyadenine is uh, insoluble in, in any sort of pH where you can't uh, 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 handle with just altering the pH these are uh, insaturable and they uh, uh, form crystals in the uh, kidneys. So this is a, a, a table to differentiate between oxalate crystals as you see here uh, the right side picture on the HND and the same HND uh, from a different patient who has this 2,8-D hydroxyadenine uh, and here you can see that the brownish color as well as more transparent color in the HND diagnosis although you can easily make out that these are all crystals. So moving on to the uh, another case uh, which is last in this section is about uh, post-transplant who had a uh, uh, primary graft uh, dysfunction uh, in less than a week is 20 year old uh, the native kidney disease was not known the donor is father uh, was done in the anticipation of uh, a rejection whether it is an antibody mediated or a cell mediated in, in a week's post transplant case but uh, to surprise uh, the scanner view as you can see here there are some contents in the tubular lumen which are blocking the uh, tubules and on the birefringence you see this again the birefringence uh, beautiful uh, birefringent crystals which are blocking this in, in uh, and this case was uh, uh, summarized as uh, you don't see the brownish color here uh, uh, and as I showed you the table in, in the earlier slide and these are the oxalate crystals uh, which is basically a recurrence in, in this patient um, uh, which might sometimes surprise you in the immediate uh, uh, assessment of immediate post-transplant biopsy. So this case was a recurrent uh, 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 recurrence of hyperaxaluria. Uh, in this patient for, and the genetic analysis also showed that they, he has a homozygous mutation. So these are about the four cases which were uh, pertaining to the metabolic, uh, two of them affecting the glomeruli and two in the tubular interstitial uh, and can be sometimes surprising in the post-transplant evaluation. So any questions uh, uh, in, in, in this respect? Uh, uh, you're welcome to, I can handle those. Sir, I would like to make one point. Uh, in addition to this, we can sometimes come across a gout uh, nephropathy or we can say gouty nephropathy. 
so how often have you come across or you come across uh, gout in uh, renal biopsy sir yeah but uh, that's again one more addition to the list of uh, uh, medullary pathology uh, they are again needle shaped uh, we do come across with the gouty crystals but nowadays the gouty nephropathy is uh, the terminology should not be used uh, earlier it was used as a gouty nephropathy but it's it's basically a tubular interstitial chronic tubular interstitial uh, disease with uh, gouty crystal deposition once the saturation of uh, urine uh in the serum uh, goes beyond 7 mg per deciliter so uh, these are uh, morphologically these are needle shape and mm, uh, uh, more seen in the medullary region uh, by refringence you can make out that these are different from uh, the oxalate crystals uh any other participant would like to ask uh, dr maisa a question uh, please uh, you are welcome to put your questions on the chat box or you can directly unmute yourself and ask uh, dr maisa please dr maisa dr vitambra has uh, uh, put a uh, compliment for you master the class with a different style of conveying important messages i absolutely agree with her Uh, the message is very very clear a, a youngster a young pathologist would uh, not learn more than this from any textbook i tell you cannot learn more than this from any textbook thank you ma'am it's all from you uh, uh, what you have taught me is what i am doing right now so, yeah, i'm just a messenger here uh sir i think we can move on to the next section sir there is yeah. no messages in the chat box so next uh, case is pertaining to the staff cpc that used to be conducted in on wednesday 8 uh, in the morning uh, this was uh, done by the faculty uh, uh, on wednesday morning uh, this uh, cpc exercises in the pj pathology uh, has taught many of us uh, who sir have been trained there and we have been watching even through the and we have learned many things from the autopsies that were conducted so uh, a large part of uh, learning goes on to the uh, uh, autopsy room uh, and the further evaluation of the cases uh, uh, similar to that uh, uh, in keeping the same uh, it so uh, there would be more of a clinical pathology correlation in this so uh, next case is pertaining to that uh i have a set of cases uh, in this diagnosis who have presented uh, with acute kidney injury and anemia uh, with a proteinuria of 2 plus uh, one of them had uh, peripheral hemolysis as well and the creatinine was uh, uh, raised uh, one uh, ranging from 7.93 to 11.3 mg per deciliter Uh, and all of them had acute kidney injury so uh, by definition it is in terms of pace uh, the deterioration of uh, each efr in in these patients uh, it is irrespective of the age like 18 or 23 or you have 36 uh, at the age presentation so uh, what you see here at the uh, medium magnification is that of uh, the glomerular as well as the tubular interstitial and the tubules have shown this cytoplasmic plebbing and in, indicates that there is uh, acute tubular injury to a moderate extent uh, and some brownish color in the cytoplasm of these tubules uh, which is seen almost diffuse in this uh, uh, slide what you see the glomerulus uh, seems to be okay normal uh, appearing in these two gloms on the closer view do you see that these are very coarse uh granular and brownish in color occupying the uh, cytoplasm of these uh, tubules all over uh and uh, there was one of the uh, uh, area where there was uh, thrombosis which was in the venular segment so in the in the uh, in the kidney like each compartment has some towards the uh, disease process so in in this case uh, it was more of a brownish colored pigment Uh, and one solitary focus of thrombus here is within the venule so and the prussian blue stain was done uh, and it was highlighting 
this has uh, bluish in color indicating that this is a ferric uh, portion that's uh, iron pigment that is getting deposited and not the lipofuscin uh, which is again uh, brownish appearing uh, uh, deposit in the tubules as a wear and tear pigment the immunofluorescence was negative uh, for all the panel and uh, in the evaluation of uh, hemocytosis in the secondary hemocytosis the classic teaching is that you evaluate for uh, the pa paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or the enzyme deficiency of the RBCs like G6PD enzyme deficiency or if there is any mechanical injury like some some patients may have uh, uh, prosthetic valves and that would be the reason why the lysis is occurring or sometimes the drug induced uh, rifampicin or uh, vague heptanes uh, would cause lysis of our disease and that would lead on to deposition of hemocytrin in the uh, 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 kidney uh, in the tubules so the further evaluation was done and in almost all of these patients the flow cytometric evaluation showed that there is a deficient uh, granulocytes of ct14 and CD59 in the RPCs, thus uh, uh, putting this case as that of a paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria presenting as acute kidney injury. Uh, and in the retrospect, all these say anemia and the peripheral hemolysis uh, would fit in uh, as a variable presentation of uh, PNH. So the classic teaching of PNH is like just like in this SLE, it can have various presentations. Similarly, in the PNH, it can have isolated anemia or pancytopenia, uh, anything uh, kind of uh, uh, drop in the counts of uh, in the blood. Uh, so this PNH is uh, the acquired clonal disorder, uh, which is uh, intrinsic membrane defect, and these are are deficient in both this anchoring proteins, the CD59 and 55, and uh, the in in the setting of this uh, workup of hemocytosis, this is the usual uh, culprit. So uh, uh, G6PD is quite rare, and uh, mechanical, uh, of course, the mechanical injury is also one of the main factor that would come as a second uh, in in the order that uh, we have encountered. So these are some of the references uh, pertaining to this uh, secondary hemosodrosis about uh, affecting the renal parenchyma. Uh, any question pertaining to this uh, is welcome. This was about the correlation of the histology pigments with the clinical history and then further workup, which completes the loop of uh, uh, the further uh, as, uh, assessment to be done in the in uh, in this case, uh, highlighting the aspects that are to be covered post the biopsy uh, findings. If there are no questions, I will go on to the next, uh, which is about the organ review, uh, which used to happen on Tuesday, uh, nine o'clock and uh, in the afternoon to. Uh, 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 Thanks to Dr. Keithi for giving me this uh, picture, the further slices uh, of the brain. Uh, you might be thinking, why am I showing the slices of brain here? But uh, the message linked to here is, uh, again, I have a uh, kidney which was not uh, utilized in, in putting in the uh, recipient, one of the kidney from deceased donor. So in that context, uh, it's easy if, uh, when you, when a, a neuropathologist looks at uh, the microscopic sections, sometimes that gives further uh, clues to what this patient has. Although radiology in neurology uh, picks up to a larger extent, but some things will be picked up by the histology and surprise both the pathologists as well as clinicians. So this is about the tale of uh, deceased donor. Uh, this was a 20, 39 years uh, male who met with road traffic accident. This was in 2012 uh, and following which he had hypertension and the family agreed to donate uh, the kidneys. Uh, the right kidney was not taken because the, he had abdominal injury and even uh, to one of the renal artery there was an injury. Uh, so they deferred this right kidney and the left kidney was sent to another center. Uh, which was engrafted. 
So the first I'll show you the right kidney which was sent fortunately the unused kidney was sent to histopathology uh, and this came three days later the sections the slides came uh, uh, since it is a unused I didn't hurry up in this case so it, the, when the slides came on third day I was literally taken aback and to see this kind of injury in the glomeruli uh, I, I immediately called up the ZCCK uh, the concerned physician who deals with the, uh, the organ donation and asked well, where is the uh, uh, paired kidney gone and uh, how is that patient doing so as you see here uh, the glomeruli are all abnormal in terms of global as well as diffuse process in the capillary lumen uh, the highest magnification comes here uh, which shows that there is a uh, Plot. I mean the fib fibrin uh, uh, thrombi along with the neutrophils which are clogged uh, clogging these capillary lumen uh, and there is hardly any capillary which is left by this process so they, it's kind of a diffuse uh, intravascular coagulation happening in this uh, uh, kidney so, uh, just to show you the various uh, stains and the uh, uh, pathology in this and the left kidney was uh, grafted in 36 years uh, male uh, who happened to have a delayed graft function uh, and the uh, graft biopsy was done for DGF on fifth uh, post-operative day so I'll come to this histology as well now so the uh, on fifth post-transplant day uh, he had uh, biopsy done with a graph uh, delayed graft function the harvesting time was prolonged uh, so initially it was uh, thought that this is the reason why he is having dgf but uh, on the histology you see that there are some infiltrates in the interstitium uh, and on the closer view these are lymphomononuclear more or less of a lymphocytes which are uh, occupying in the interstitium so this definitely calls for a, a cell mediated and going on to the further that these are even causing damage in the artery here causing uh, end arteritis and one of the uh, artery here it's the panel which shows that there is a infiltration of uh, um, uh, lymphocytes beneath the subendothelium indicating that there is end arteritis and one of the glomerulus even showed that there is evidence of neutrophilic infiltrate with swollen endothelial appearance causing uh, glomerulitis. So th there is acute glomerular as well as vascular and the cell mediated rejection and the C40 was negative. So none of these gloms, the fibrin thrombi which was seen in the opposite kidney uh, were evident in, in this uh, 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 glomerulus. So th this was uh, a learning point for me that uh, no matter how extensive is the uh, capillary thrombosis which is happening in the kidney in the donor patient uh, it's just uh, 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 it's kind of a diuresis once it uh, it's put in uh, a new uh, milieu so when I uh, looked up the literature there, there are there were reports of uh, donor induced intravascular coagulation and on the recipients which goes on to say that uh, the donor DIC was not associated with short term suboptimal graft function or uh, uh, which is defined as a slow graft function or the delayed graft function and it's uh, pretty much there in the retrospective cohort of 162 transplants and having the DIC in the donor so uh, it's absolutely fine to uh, assess as a pre -end plantation donor biopsy uh, if there is a road traffic accident and look for if there is any other uh, pathology if there are only microthrombi then it is uh, probably related to uh, road traffic accident induced uh, coagulation uh, derangement and that's fine perfectly fine to uh, take up the kidneys for um, uh, doing the transplants so in in this uh, uh, two case reports they saw that the further uh, 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 disappearance of this uh, fibrin drawn by by fifth to seventh day which exactly happened in in our case also like on the fifth post transplant day which was uh, uh, the biopsy was done showed acute rejection 
uh, involving all the compartments, but the fibrin capillary the thrombi were absent. And following this uh, learning patient, uh, we have uh, quite a number of uh, uh, cases where we do get pre-implantation uh, biopsies from the deceased donor who have met with road traffic accident. And this is a kind of fibrin thrombi which we do uh, see uh, and they, uh, the clinicians have taken up these kidneys and the patients are doing well, although there is a risk of uh, delayed graft function in these cases, which is attributed. So this is a recent paper which uh, says uh, that there, there is a significant portion of these disease donor DIC will go on for almost 28% will have uh, a delayed graft function in, in this kind of scenarios. So this was about uh, the learning uh, from the microscopic evaluation of the unused kidney for whatever reason it was given to us, but it, it has a huge uh, a learning point of, uh, to learn from and uh, to continue the practice in evaluation of pre-implantation biopsies. So I'm left with one more case. Uh, that's the final one. Shall I continue? Uh, Yes, sir. Please continue. Yeah. Uh, the CPCs which were done on Monday at uh, 8 in the morning was usually done by the uh, students. And the cases that used to be uh, selected for student CPCs because of the lack of time there for the discussion, uh, there were two cases. But uh, 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 the learning points would be for the residents to en uh, engross the uh, usual cases like tuberculosis or uh, cirrhosis. Uh, so those kind of cases were uh, assigned in the student CPCs, but there were some little surprises. Uh, 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 and I was fortunate to have some of the surprise cases to have uh, presented in the student CPCs, to name few, uh, Takaisus in four-year-old child and uh, pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis uh, in the lungs, which are... Uh, yeah. Mm. So next case is about the same uh, as a surprise. Uh, this is about a 55 years female who presented with anemia and uh, increasing proteinuria of 1.7 grams, which are slowly increasing for a period of one year. Uh, and she had anemia of 6. Point, uh, HB of 6.7 grams with an elevated ESR. So uh, urine routine had G plus of albumin and uh, 25 to 30 percils. So SPEP evaluation and the ANA, uh, uh, everything was done in the uh, serology, which was non-contributory. The ultrasound, uh, the kidneys were of normal sized. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a past history of proteinuria following the uh, intake of phenytoin for dystonia almost one year, one and a half year ago. So the histology was a surprise here, uh, although the presentation is that of a subnephrotic range proteinuria. Uh, this was a, uh, here at the scanner, you see that the glomeruli are pretty enlarged and they're almost proliferative. You, do, you don't see any capillary lumen here in, in any of these uh, glomeruli. So the high magnification uh, shows that the capillary lumen shows uh, hypercellularity and this hypercellularity is basically because of uh, infiltrative cells which are uh, coming from outside the kidney that's which is in the circulation uh, and these uh, description of these cells would uh, be of a moderate sized nucleus with some having a nucleolar prominence a very conspicuous nucleolus uh, here and with all this this is a easy cakewalk kind of case but for uh, in the kidney biopsy uh, uh, interpretation this would take some time uh, not to jump in calling it as some kind of a vague lesion but you would want to definitely uh, evaluate this further and this is the PA stain which beautifully highlights the uh, network of these normal tough uh, compartments and the uh, encircling or uh, uh, these uh, mono monotonous appearing uh, cells. So th these are basically monotonous appearing lymphoid cells which have a very high uh, degree of mitotic activity, very brisk uh, kind of dividing cells and uh, they are occupying the capillary lumen. 
uh, again the silver stain gives you the uh, good details of this nuclear chromatin which is more or less a uh, clump uh, the uh, condensed chromatin uh, in in these uh, uh, lymphoid cells which are monomorphic so the immunoassay chemistry what we did uh, was uh, first we did uh, uh, we didn't want to waste the tissue and first we did the cd3 immunoassay chemistry uh, which came as negative and the same slide was d stain and then we did the cd20 uh, which uh, highlighted these lymphoid uh, cells as uh, uh, cd20 positive cells in the these abnormally uh, uh, lymphoid population and the k67 as you saw the mitotic figure this was very brisk high uh, k proliferative index uh, and the pcl2 was uh, positive in in these uh, lymphoid cells uh, immunofluorescence was negative and post biopsy workup uh, showed that the ldh was elevated uh, uh, based on the morphology we thought of that this is a case of uh, intravascular b cell lymphoma uh, and uh, asked for the uh, organ involvement like the uh, uh, skin as well as the nervous system examination which found out to be normal uh, in terms of clinical assessment uh, and the ct chest was also normal without having any lymphadenopathy whether in the internal or the external uh, uh, lymph nodes enlargement so this was uh, uh, summarized as a intravascular b cell lymphoma uh, uh, which is kind of a rare uh, form of uh, diffuse large b cell lymphoma uh, often fatal and uh, thus it is uh, diagnosed at the autopsy uh, very uh, occasional uh, it can be seen as a renal biopsy surprise or sometimes uh, when uh, uh, there is any biopsy which is done uh, perfect uh, for doing a biopsy but uh, of course the renal or second dermatology manifestations yes definitely there is a scope for biopsy and usually these patients are present with the b symptoms and as i said it's quite uh, aggressive and uh, fatal without any immediate intervention uh, less than a year survival is hardly any uh, 20 or 30% without any treatment so this is about the uh, uh, intra vascular uh, b cell lymphoma it's basically the defect is in the homing of the, these mono uh, abnormal uh, lymphoid cells so they they do they, they lack this cd11 or some ligand which uh, the uh, uh, seeps in into the lymphoid tissue and thus it it's just uh, goes on circulating everywhere on the usual organs or uh, kidney skin and the cns so with that uh, uh, i end with uh, this slide uh, saying that whatever the disease may be the presentation is usually the proteinuria the um, uh, hematuria or the drop in egfr so there is a, a lot more to look uh, in 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 various angles so um, it's good to see the slide unbiased with the clinical information uh, and then again reevaluate with the help of whatever the clinical information that is being provided so it's just uh, 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 putting all the things together clinical uh, the light microscopic findings immunofluorescence and then electron microscopy to arrive at a uh, some sort of reasonable uh, clinical pathology correlation and mm, you're done with it uh, uh, your job is done once you put in all these three so uh, this is the visor palace and during the lighting session it it would simply look like this uh, with that i in my talk uh, i'm happy to take any questions so i'm sorry i kept you uh, so long it's it's almost like 1 uh, hour 45 minutes but uh, i would like to congratulate you on such a beautiful beautiful presentation Uh, like uh, the last case was as big as a surprise uh, for me as this was one of the cases that you had showed me with a microphylaria in one of the glomerular mm -hmm. tuft i don't i don't uh, know whether you remember that case or not but yes, yes, yes. i had seen that in your lab uh, with a microphylaria that was as big a surprise i like like the one that intravascular uh, lymphoma so uh, there are some uh, compliments for you sir 
and uh, dr anita they want she wants to say that thank you for presentation and presenting uh, these beautiful cases uh, dr ravindra prabhu he wants to congratulate great series of cases and uh, dr anand bardia one of our juniors from pgi he wants to say thank you sir for all the outstanding cases and uh, and uh, there are a couple of comments from youtube also sir uh, uh, dr das madam she wants to say that uh, uh, thank you for such a good and uh, educating seminar sir it had all the flavors of pgi mer uh, academic activities and that makes me proud too sir um, thank you so if if somebody has a question please uh, unmute your mics and you can directly ask to dr mahesha madam sir maybe you can uh, uh, like uh, put up a few questions if you want <laughs> uh, i don't qualify to ask questions to mahesh <laughs> uh i can only okay i don't think so there are there are any questions there is only one more comment in the youtube kirti says great collection of cases that's professor kirti from pgi i i completely agree with what dr nobanita said it had all the flavor of the weekly academic jargons which we all go through from monday to saturday in the reverse order and very nicely presented in a very nice manner and trying to put things in perspective starting right from saturday the journal club right up to monday the student cpc so it is a very unique way of having a, a side seminar which brings in a lot of flavor as well as it brings in a completely a different groups of activities which goes through and case based on those groups of activity wonderfully done dr mahesh reminds me of uh, mm, uh, <coughs> of uh, you can say rahul dravid <laughs> so steady wall which is so perfect and so clear so he exactly knows what he is doing tadim sir yes that's uh, man who can face uh, 600 deliveries to score uh, 200 runs <laughs> <laughs> yes so you he's basically like wall. he's like a wall yes and dr mahesh is like a wall in nephropathology you can see that and the gamut of cases which was shown uh, and all cases had a really, beautiful, beautiful very it is going to be a, a big learning ex thing uh, material for everybody on the youtube we shall be sharing the recorded youtube to for everybody to listen to it and learn from it there is so much to learn from this i can't imagine you know how helpful it will be for all the post graduates the frc path players who are right waiting to appear in the march exam which is on the way thank you so much and um, uh, i don't think so that there are any questions uh, thank you dr devashish uh, for you know taking all the trouble of uh, moderating this session and uh, you know uh, adding your own experience to this so wonderfully done thank you so much thank you sir thank you for the opportunity Oh, it's always a pleasure. It's always my. One last thing, sir. sir. I would like to read out. Uh, Dr. Shubhradeep has uh, like uh, congratulated sir, and he has told simply outstanding. Many such cases are seen in autopsy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, sir, bro. I think you are referring to the last case that. Yeah. Yes, yes, of, uh, absolutely. Serial lymphoma, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Before before we close the session, I would just like to announce that we have a talk tomorrow. and this is at 8:30 after this uh, cytology golden talk i think people should be very much interested in this it is immunohistochemistry and molecular profiling of brain tumors by dr shilpa rao uh, this would be very interesting for all the neuropathologist right from nephropathology we we move into neuropathology tomorrow and that would be very interesting so um, with that uh, i think i i thank everybody uh, for participating in this we had a big crowd in in youtube and a very big crowd in google meet and um, before i close let me once again thank dr mahesh sha thank you so much for consenting to taking out time and presenting such thank wonderful you. cases sharing your knowledge your you have astounding knowledge in nephropathology and thank you for sharing that just before closing dr rajiv shukla from liverpool 
excellent i will watch at my leisure so you have people you know all across and uh, definitely by tomorrow morning the entire far east and the europe would have seen your lecture on the youtube and we'll be receiving comments from there i'll be putting it up to you as well thank you so sure. much everybody god bless you thank you so much good night take care bye thank you, sir. good night good night